Hello YouTubers, welcome to Big Buddha is Watching, I'm Big Buddha. So in these uncertain times, I know it may seem trite to continuously be obsessing over the minutiae of cinema, but it's times like these where I believe little avenues of escapism are more important than ever in our day-to-day -day existence. So I ask you, my viewers, all four of you, to come along with me for the next quarter hour or so as I try and take your mind off any impending apocalypse that may be on the horizon. With that in mind, the film I'm looking at today is the 1986 screwball satire, Whoops Apocalypse. This film actually started life in 1982 on ITV as a sitcom. Six episodes were made originally, written by Andrew Marshall and David Rennick. I've talked about them before. They were a writing partnership. They co-wrote many sitcoms and sketch shows throughout the 1980s. They also wrote Wilt, which I've looked at previously on this channel. I'm a big fan of their work. Rennick, of course, went on to create Jonathan Creek and One Foot in the Grave, which is one of my favourite sitcoms. Marshall would go on to create 2.4 Children, which isn't. Whoops Apocalypse was unusual in that it wasn't structured like a traditional sitcom. It wasn't focused around a few single characters and locale. It felt tonally much more like a Monty Python skit about the lead up to World War III, only stretched out to three hours in length. It was screwball, scattershot, anarchic, fast-paced humour. 1982 was when alternative comedy was just breaking through into the mainstream, and the series had a very alt-comedy vibe to it. The cast actually featured Alexi Sale and Rick Mail in a couple of supporting roles. If I had to pitch the series, then a possible way to sum it up in a single tagline might be Dr. Strangelove, by way of Monty Python. Just to give a brief overview of the TV version before we get onto the film, the Rogues Gallery of Central Characters featured Johnny Cyclops, the US President, his right-hand man the Deacon, played by Reginald Perrin's John Barron, Commissar Solzienskin is played by Alexei Sale, we have John Cleese in the cast as Lacrobat, the world's number one terrorist, master of disguise, an obvious parody of Carlos the Jackal, Premier Dubienkin, played by Richard Griffiths, a character who continuously dies throughout the series and is taken over by clones of himself. At the time of broadcast, Leonid Brezhnev had just been superseded as head of state by Yuri Andropov. So I'm guessing this is meant to be some commentary on the way the new regime in Russia was exactly the same as the old one. You also had the British Prime Minister Kevin Pork, played by the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy himself, Peter Jones. In the show, the character goes mad and believes himself to be Superman. So the series was kind of a minor hit at the time, and fondly remembered by those that saw it, but unfortunately, owing to the fact the conceit of the series charts the events leading up to Armageddon, there was no scope for a second series. Rennick and Marshall wrote themselves into a corner somewhat, and were hindered by their own concept. I think if they were ever able to do a second series, Whoops Apocalypse would have much greater name recognition now. So, perhaps owing to the fact that they couldn't, Four years later, they produced the feature film version instead. To all intents and purposes, this was the second series. Although the film version conceptually and tonally marries up with the TV series, it has a completely different plot and, for the most part, set of characters. It's still a wacky, screwball comedy about the lead up to World War III. It retains the same vein of humour. It has a lot of the same tropes, the same pinball approach to the globe-trotting narrative exposition doled out by news anchors, cutting condemnation of the heads of state, that kind of thing. So the film is essentially the second series, or as close as we ever got to one. Personally, I think the format works a lot better as a film. The format lends itself to that Monty Python review approach to movie narrative storytelling. As I say, the film is a completely new and original story. That's not to say there aren't some holdovers from the TV version, though. There are some jokes that get reused. And now the rest of the news. Doris Cronkite, the woman who secured a lock of Frank Sinatra's hair in 1958, has today sold it back to him for an undisclosed sum. <laughs> Edna Berkowitz, the woman who secured a lock of Frank Sinatra's hair in 1955, has today sold it back to him for an undisclosed sum. Instead of Peter Jones, you have Peter Cook as the British PM Sir Mortimer Chris. And again, they use the Prime Minister going mad storyline. Only in this version, it manifests as a belief in pixies rather than thinking himself to be Superman. Because we all know what really causes unemployment in this country, don't we, gentlemen? Unemployment in this country is caused by pixies. <coughs> when did you actually form this theory, Prime Minister? 
Because of this, the rest of his party, headed by a pre-one-foot-in-the-grave Richard Wilson, continuously attempt to have him assassinated throughout the film. Also in the cast, you have Mashie's Loretta Swit as the first female US head of state, Barbara Adams. You're telling me that the entire population of Great Britain went and elected a deranged psychotic to the highest office of the land. Again? I've never been too sure whether this was a self-referential joke about the fact they were reusing the Prime Minister going mad storyline from the TV series, or whether it was simply a pop at Thatcher. Either's possible. There are a couple of allusions to former presidents in the film. Switch's deceased predecessor is described as a former circus performer. To the world, he was an ambassador for peace, truth, and the American ideal. But to citizens in his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, he will always be Uncle Yuck Yuck, star of the Big Top. And it was in Cleveland at 11.30 this morning that the president was finally laid to rest according to his last wishes. <laughs> This was a pop at Reagan being a former actor and entertainer. She also visits another former president locked up in jail and working on a chain gang. So, Mr. President, how's life? Oh, still serving it. <laughs> this one has written a memoir called Commie Bastards I Hate, so obviously this is supposed to be Nixon. Also in the cast you have Ian Richardson as an openly gay naval captain. Darling! Darling, where are you? In here, darling. It looks as if there's going to be a bit of a scrap in the Caribbean. They're sending a task force down to get the Maguas out of Santa Maria. Dickie. I'm not scared. Of course not. You're not the one that's got to go. No, I know. Just as well, really. I get damnably seasick. I suppose you'll be wanting your uniform back then. Quite a progressive character for the time. There are a couple of holdovers from the TV series in the cast. Alexei Sale appears playing a different character this time around. He's still a Soviet, only this time instead of interrogating potential Western spies, he's hiding nuclear missiles on a Caribbean island just off the coast of the US. So allusions to Cuba abound. In the series, Rick Mail has a cameo as Biff, a political songwriter. In the film, he has a slightly more prolonged cameo as the head of an SAS task force. Rick Mail's cameo is the highlight of the film for me, but then a Rick Mail cameo is the highlight of anything for me. He was actually the reason I watched the film in the first place. I remember it coming on at 1 in the morning on ITV back in the day and spotting his name in the credits. I remember thinking, oh, Rick Mail's in this. I'll just watch it until he shows up. Of course, he shows up 10 minutes from the end, which is why I ended up watching the whole thing. Much like in his Blackadder 2 episode, the creators saved the best for last. The energy that Mail could bring to enliven proceedings would always give projects a much needed shot in the arm at just the right moment. I don't know if they were expecting John Cleese to be in the film, Lacrobat the character he played, being the only character they held over wholesale from the series. Here he is replaced by a pre-Seinfeld Michael Richards. I actually find Richards an improvement over Cleese. As much as I love Cleese, I find his Lacrobat to be actually one of his worst performances and proof that he's only really at his best in things he's penned himself. In the series, Lacrobat comes across a little like a Python character that's been written by a fan, rather than Cleese or one of the other members, so he feels a little unsure on his feet in the performance. Also, John Cleese isn't really a character actor. The idea behind Lacrobat is that he is a master of disguise. I think you really need a Peter Sellers type to pull off a part like this, and John Cleese isn't that. I mean, I guess it's part of the joke, but he isn't very good at slipping into different accents and characters. Open that casket and you will be damned for all eternity. So I actually prefer Michael Richards in the role, although Richards isn't primarily a character actor either. I think he pulls off the switch from disguise to disguise a lot more convincingly than Cleese does, even if he does have an unfortunate blackface moment at one point. And I forgot to introduce you to my dog, Hack. Well, I'll tell you, without this little Labrador, I'd be blinder than a bug in a badger's backside. 
but I do get the impression that they were maybe expecting Cleese to return to play the role, if only because Lacrobat probably has the most screen time of any of the characters. Some of the humour in this is a little dated now. In both the series and the film, there are moments where women appear topless. It's humour that won't fly today. 80s liberated boardiness, or a holdover from the carry-on era, it's sometimes difficult to tell. There's a character called Princess Wendy, apparently inspired by Princess Diana. Basically, one just wants to be treated like any other ordinary nursing officer, sir. I'm sure you understand. No fuss or favours. Absolutely not, ma'am. Of course. This is your cabin. Thank you. And in one scene, they have her chained up in bondage gear. The joke seems to be, oh look, we put a Princess Diana type in bondage gear. It just seems like an excuse to have this attractive young actress chained up in leather. You just don't get things this brazenly smutty anymore. The plot of the film is essentially anchored around the kidnapping by Lacrobat of Princess Wendy, aka Diana. And this is the thing that fuels the story and sets the events in motion leading up to World War III. I'm going to spoil the ending of the film now only because the best joke in the film is not the final line, but the final word. If you don't want it ruining for you, turn off this video now. Ian Richardson's naval captain is hypnotised at one point into thinking the room is on fire whenever anyone snaps their fingers. At the end of the film, after Rickmail has managed to kill Lacrobat and inadvertently save the princess, the need for nuclear retaliation is averted. However, when Richardson is told to call off the strike, he goes into a trance. So, what do we do? What do I tell them, sir? Sir, what do I tell them? Sir! I always thought that was a funny way to end the film. This film is kind of underrated, I think. It was overlooked on release. I think those that saw the series unfavorably compared it. I never actually saw the series until I watched it in preparation for this review. I was always a fan of the film first and foremost, and I think it's a much better film than people give it credit for. Having seen the series now, I do prefer it to its TV counterpart. I think it works a lot better in the 90 minute format, minus the laughter track. Okay, it never hits the heights of a Python film, which is what I would probably compare the tone and style to the most. It's not in that league, but then few comedies are. This is not a bad comedy at all. There are far worse ones out there that we've all seen. Whoops Apocalypse is satire at its most anarchic fun. Most anarchic fun. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to say on that score. It's not a terribly well-known film, but it's one I've always enjoyed, which is why I wanted to highlight it today. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And until next time, this is me, Big Buddha, signing off, and I shall see you all out there in YouTube land. Thank you.